Blair General Hospital emergency. I'm Paul Messenger. Yes, Mr. Messenger. Dr. Carew's expecting you. Use the first elevator. Thank you. Say, ain't that the Wall Street guy, the bozo with all the dough in the world? Yes, it is. You know, he didn't even have on a diamond ring. Oh, diamonds on men are vulgar. I wish I was vulgar. Before we go in, Mr. Messenger, let me prepare you. Dr. Gillespie is an inspiration to the whole medical profession. But physically, he's worse off than most of his patients. His legs are hopelessly crippled. I'll take care of it, Dr. Carew, right away. I want to do a thing. Oh, I want to see Dr. Gillespie. I'm sorry, Dr. Carew. He has a patient. Well, but I... Uh, we'll wait. Here's the pamphlet, Dr. Gillespie. Mrs. Roberts, you're going to have a baby. Why, what's the matter? I'm afraid. Afraid? Yes. Why? Women die. Well, suppose your mother felt that way about it. My mother had courage. I'm a coward. Mrs. Roberts, nature is a very wonderful thing. It takes the food you eat and changes it into the particular substances our body needs. If we break a bone, why, nature will provide the extra calcium to mend that bone. If anything, it will be stronger than it was before. Well, you understand that, don't you? Yes, Doctor. Well, now, that's just what's going to happen when you have your baby. Nature will see that you have the strength and courage you need. Come on over here to the window. And you see all those people down there? Those thousands of them? Yes. Well, the mothers of every one of those children felt exactly the same way you do. And so did their mothers. And those generations really had something to worry about. Because we doctors hadn't progressed very far. They were in real danger. Maybe it sounds silly to you, this horrible worry. But I couldn't help it. My husband's worried, too. Well, you go on home and tell your husband you're going to be all right. With modern methods, we seldom lose a mother. And we've no case on record where we've ever lost a father. Thank you, Doctor. I feel so much better. Sure you do. You take this pamphlet and follow the instructions. Take good care of yourself. And come back here and see me any time you want to. What's your first name, Doctor? Leonard. Leonard. Leonard, that's nice. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, uh, my middle name is Barry. Thank you. No, Carnival, I won't let you have another nickel. Aren't you ashamed of yourself, an intelligent adult like you, gambling your wages away week after week? But someday I'm going to win it all back. Well, in the meanwhile, find another sap to borrow it from. Someday I'm going to sit down and prove to you you can't win money in a crap game. Get out. Yes, sir, I guess maybe you is right, sir. I've often thought I'd give up gambling and just stick to playing the races. Nurse! Yes, Dr. Gillespie. Dr. Carew, I'm... Never mind, Dr. Carew. Where's Dr. Kildare? I don't know. Isn't he here? If he was here, do you think I'd be asking you about him? I don't know. I worked for you for so long, nothing you'd say would surprise me. Nurse Parker, Dr. Kildare is my assistant. He's here every morning, promptly at 8 o'clock. It's now six minutes past nine, and no Dr. Kildare. What do you deduce from these facts? I guess Dr. Kildare is late. Oh, jumping gee, Hossifat. Will you find Dr. Kildare? Where shall I look? Well, where do you think he'd be? I don't know. You keep your stethoscope in the wastebasket and your checkbook in the bathroom. How should I know where to look for your assistant? 
Dr. Carew wants... If Dr. Carew wants anything out of me, tell him to come down here and ask me. Oh, he is here. Oh. Well, show him in. Show him in. Why didn't you say so? Yes, doctor. Dr. Carew? Ah, Carew. Come in. Come in. Must be something very important that brings the head of the hospital here. Uh, Leonard, this is Mr. Paul Messenger. Paul Messenger? Do you mean to tell me I'm actually in the presence of how many millions of dollars? Leonard. Well, make it 18 million. <laughs> A sucker, huh? Where'd you get him? What can I do for you, Mr. Messenger? Dr. Gillespie, I've come here because I need your help. Well, that's very fine, but did you notice a room full of patients waiting at my door? Why, yes. Well, I've only one rule. First come, first serve. Rich, poor, and in the middle. Leonard. Dr. Gillespie's quite right. I'm sorry. I'll take my turn. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Might be three hours. I'll wait. Leonard, Mr. Messenger is a very important man. So am I. Let him wait. Nurse! Send in the next patient. No, 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 wait a minute. Hold the next patient. Come in here. Yeah. Hold the next patient. I think I'll grab about five minutes sleep. Fix the alarm clock, will you? And mind you, I said five minutes. Yeah. Send the next patient in as soon as you hear the alarm go. Nine minutes past nine. That's a nice round time to come to work. I thought you were asleep. I never sleep. Seems I can't say as much for you. I guess it's the country boy in me. Now, listen, son. As my assistant, you naturally have certain privileges around here, but uh, sleeping till noon is not one of them. Dr. Kildare. Well, Nosy, what do you want? Dr. Kildare's breakfast is here. Breakfast? I didn't order any breakfast. I did. You worked here all night, and I figured you'd need it. What's the idea, Jimmy? Uh, getting those pneumonia statistics? They done? All done. Well, it's very plain. You're trying to make it more and more difficult for me to get along without you. Trying to make it impossible. You have made it impossible. There's so much work to do and so little time to do it. Thank you. Oh, and you know, Doctor, when I finished medical school, I only knew that I wanted to do something in medicine. And I met you and everything was crystallized. Now I have what I wanted. The privilege of working for you and learning at first hand what only you can teach me. And carrying my work on after I'm gone. I won't be for a long while yet. No, that's not true. You know it. Nurse, next patient, please. Ah, oh, Mr. Finch, sit down. Jimmy, have they told you yet who's outside there waiting to see me? <laughs> no, sir. Pulse irregular, rapid. Mr. Paul Messenger, the United States Mint in person, is outside there waiting to see me. Cough. <coughs> and he's going to wait three hours. Cough. <coughs> Blood pressure 172 over 100. Go on, put your shirt on. No, 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 no. Wait a minute, I want to talk to you. Say, we don't want to let him get off the hook. Nurse! Is Mr. Messenger still out there? He's still there, Doctor. No, that's fine. Mr. Finch, you've been drinking again. It seems to me I remember a promise you made me a couple of months ago. Doctor, I tried to stop, but I can't do it. It's not my fault. My father was the same way. You understand, don't you, sir? No, I don't. 
You're a fool and there are a million other fools like you. They want to drink so they believe a legend started by a bigger fool that you can inherit drunkenness. Well, that's a lot of baloney. You can inherit a tendency toward diabetes or red hair. But if you drink, it's your own fault. And you can't blame your poor ancestors. But I always heard that. Yeah, and you were glad to hear it because it gave you an excuse for sticking a bottle in your silly face. Now go on and get out of here. And don't come back until you've stopped kidding yourself. Yes, sir. Next patient. No. no. Uh, bring in Mr. Messenger. Yes, doctor. Mr. Messenger. Come in, Mr. Messenger. Come in, come in. Uh, uh, sit down, Mr. Messenger. Sit down. Uh, this is Dr. Kildare, my assistant. How do you do? How do you do? You know, there are still a lot of people ahead of me, Doctor. Ah, uh -huh, but there's not one of them I can charge as much as I'm going to charge you. That's fair enough if you can help me. <laughs> well, you look well enough, but I can find something wrong with you. Worst comes to the worst, we can always take out your appendix. <laughs> What can we do for you, Mr. Messenger? Well, I came here to ask your advice about my daughter, Nancy. Oh, that's easy enough. Just bring her in, we'll have a look at her. I've tried to work her for six months to see a doctor. Uh, only two kinds of people don't want to see doctors. Those that know they're well and those that know they're not. Something has happened to her. It doesn't seem to be physical. And yet it must be, because she can't possibly have a care in the world. What you mean? is that in a thousand and one baffling little ways, your daughter's changed. That's it. That's exactly the situation. Uh, uh, just what kind of changes, Mr. Messenger? Well, she always was fond of dancing. But now she wants to go out all night, every night. Oh, that doesn't mean a thing. They call them jitterbirds. Jitterbugs, Dr. Gillespie. She's engaged to a splendid young man who adores her. And all of a sudden, she's started to treat him abominably. Well, perhaps it isn't important, but when she sleeps, she keeps the lights burning. Ah, well, that's bad. But uh, there's not a thing in the world a doctor can do for your daughter if she won't see him, Mr. Messenger. You were just about my last hope. I'm going to let you have Dr. Kildare. Jimmy, tonight you disguise yourself as a potted palm or something and find out what's the matter with Miss Messenger. If it takes all night. If it takes a dozen visits or a hundred. Excuse me. The expense isn't important. No, but a thousand lives a month are important. Tomorrow, Dr. Kildare and I are starting out on a long-planned experiment. This is sulfur pyridine. Before it was discovered, the death rate of pneumonia was 25%. Sulfur pyridine's brought it down to 7 My wife is under this 25%. Well, tomorrow, Dr. Kildare and I are going to start trying to find out why those 7% still die. I understand. I'll send my car for you at 8 o'clock. Goodbye. Goodbye, sir. And thank you both. Mm -hmm. Kildare. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I, I was thinking... Uh... Yes, I know what you were thinking. You were thinking, now, tonight, I can't go out gallivanting with that pretty nurse, Mary Lamont. Gallivanting? You know how much gallivanting I can do on my salary. I read in the paper the other day there's a doctor in Europe who claims love is a disease and that he can vaccinate you against it. Mm -hmm. Interns on $20 a month won't need any of that vaccination. Leonard Gillespie, you've done a lot of crazy things in your life, but this time you've certainly... T oh. Well, what are you stalling around here for? Go eat your breakfast. What do you mean, busting in on me like that? You can't have anything confidential to tell me. I know everything that everybody's doing in this shooting gallery, especially the things they're trying to hide. I mean, you have a lot of students telling you things. Ah, Molly, you hurt me. Well, let me tell you something. My students know every move your students make. My students are people of honor, which is more than you can say for that bunch of loafers that report to you. You bought an airplane. For 20 years we've worked together, and now you start spying on me. What in the name of common sense are you going to do with an airplane? Well, I just thought it'd be nice to have in case of fire. Oh, come here, Molly. I only borrowed the plane. 
It's to fly Jimmy Kildare back and forth while we're trying to work out this sulfur pyridine business. Well, at least there's one blessing. You're not planning to do that part of the work yourself. Leonard. Huh? You're tired, aren't you? Oh, a little bit. Well, why don't you take a nap right now? Well, just to get rid of you, I'll grab five minutes sleep now. Yeah. You fix the clock for me? Yeah. Where's my hat? Hat? Yeah, quit clowning. Where did you put it? Have you a picture of the hat, Dr. Kildare? Well, is there a hat? Our records show no entry of a hat in this hospital. Where's my hat? Dude, it was never x-rayed. What was wrong with your hat, Dr. Kildare? Did it need an operation? Say, why don't you try the maternity ward? Maybe it's going to have a little baby hat. All right, you asked for it, so don't blame me. Um, Dr. Joyner, hmm? uh, there is working in this hospital a very beautiful young nurse named... Uh, Miss Lopez. Hmm. She has uh, big brown eyes. She wears a uniform just a little tighter than all the other nurses. Well, sir, the other day I was up on the fourth floor. And I just happened to pass that little room where they keep the flowers, you know. Well, what do you think I saw? Oh, no, now, wait a minute. Shut up. Here's your blame hat. Say, wait a minute. Don't hold out on us. What was he doing with Miss Lopez? Oh, well, uh, Miss Lopez was alone. I can't help it if Dr. Joyner has a guilty conscience. <laughs> Money, 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 money. Oh, oh. There it is, a half month salary, ten bucks. Hollins? Eight years grammar school, four years high school, two years pre-med, four years medical school. Then, if you're lucky, you get a job here as an intern, where every single month they force 20 bucks on you. Oh, that doesn't stop Phil there. He still rushes Mary Lamont. Maybe he's in love with her money. After all, you know, she's a nurse. She makes 85 bucks a month. Ah, a gigolo. Dr. Kildare. Wanted an emergency entrance right away. Thought this was your night off. Yeah, well, that's what he thought, but Dr. Gillespie changed his mind for him. Say, look, look, if you've got to work tonight, uh, why can't I take out Mary Lamont? Well, I don't know why, but uh, I bet she can think of a reason. <laughs> Blair General Hospital. No, mister, I can't tell you that. I'm just the telephone operator here. Of course I work in a hospital, but I don't understand medicine. My brother's been managing a chicken farm for ten years, but he still can't lay an egg. Sorry. Have you seen Mary Lamont? She said for you to pick her up at 41st Street and Gaylor Avenue. Mr. Kildare here yet, or do you want me to ride around the block again? Oh, coming. Where'd he get that bus? It was the first prize in a mind your own business contest. There she is on the corner. Yes, sir. Hello, cutie. Hey, you in the blue hat. How about a little ride, sugar? Listen, you half-baked street corner Romeo. If I ever decide to take a ride... Oh, Jimmy. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't recognize you. I thought I saw a pretty girl and I was trying to grab her off. Sure, grab her off, rush her to the hospital and take out her tonsil. Uh, yeah, step in and find out different. Just a minute, young man. What do you think you're trying to get away with? Picking up girls on my beat. Oh, I wasn't picking up any girls. Don't tell me. I heard every word you said. Can I ever meet my boyfriend without you sticking your nose in? Besides, how do we know you're an officer? Well, because, uh, uh, I'll fight it out among yourselves. Get inside before anything else happens. Well, I suppose the car ought to slay me, but I bet it belongs to one of Gillespie's rich patients. <laughs> I'd have borrowed his yacht, only it wasn't raining. Oh, I'm awfully sorry I have to work tonight, Mary. That's all right, Jimmy. I guess there's nothing we can do about it. You're a nurse. You know there isn't. I'm sick of being a nurse. The next time I'm born, I want to be a pretty thing with... An empty head and a cash register for a heart. 
Well, you can always quit the hospital, can't you? Why don't I? I don't know. I guess because you're crazy enough to want to be a nurse. You're a little crazy yourself, you know. <laughs> I know it isn't ethical to ask a doctor about his patients, but where are you going? Well, it isn't ethical, but I can tell you this. It's 53 blocks to the home of the gent that owns this car. Here we are. Hmm. Shortest 53 blocks I've ever seen. Say. Hmm? Well, in case you're not impressed, they tell me that Paul Messenger is the seventh richest man in America. Jimmy, and he's your patient. No, not Mr. Messenger, his daughter. His daughter? Uh, the one that's in the newspapers all the time, the glamour girl? I guess so. What's the matter with her? That's what I'm trying to find out. Good night, Mary. I'll wait. Oh, well, I don't know how long I'll be. Well, my evening's ruined anyway. I might as well wait. What? That might take hours. You aren't going to operate on the girl, are you? <laughs> she doesn't even know I'm a doctor. Say, what is this? Nothing. Well, as a matter of fact, Dr. Gillespie said to find out what was wrong with her if it took all night. All night? Yes, well, it's all right, because her father knows I'm going to work on her. Oh, her father knows. Yes, you see, she's been acting peculiarly of late, and Mr. Messenger doesn't care what lengths we go to as long as we fix her up. Well, I've heard a lot about how debutantes carry on, but I've never heard of one having a father's permission. No, stop kidding me. You mustn't be prejudiced against Miss Messenger just because she's rich. You mustn't be prejudiced just because she's young and beautiful. Blair General Hospital, please. Although Nancy has been conducting herself on the whole, as I outlined to you and Dr. Gillespie, to my amazement at dinner tonight, she was her own normal sweet self. Nancy? Dad, come in. Dad, you're just in time to tell me how. Oh. This is Mr. Kildare, the son of an old friend of mine. How do you do, Miss Messenger? Hello, Mr. Kildare. The Carter party, remember? Oh, but don't look at my costume now. Wait till I get the headdress on. You two go downstairs and I'll make a grand entrance. All right, dear. You're the loveliest thing I've ever seen. Just like your mother. Yesterday she said she wouldn't go to this stupid fancy dress party under any circumstances. Let's wait and see. Don't shoot, Mr. Messenger. It's me, Charlie. If there's ever any doubt in your mind about my loving your daughter, remember I put this outfit on because she wanted me to. Well, once for love, I went out as the back half of a horse. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kildare, Mr. Heron, my daughter's fiance. Mr. Kildare, how do you do? Why, Nancy. Excuse me. Hello, Nancy. Uh, you'll have to excuse me, Charlie. I'm not going to the party. You're not going? No. No, I don't want to go. If I don't want to go, I don't have to go, so I'm not going. Getting a little tired of this merry-go-round, Nancy. Good night. It doesn't seem more than six months ago that you told me your entire life was wrapped up in that boy. I do love him. You see? Now what? I don't know. Now, I suppose, the lights will be blazing all night in her room, and I'll be pacing this floor, wondering how I can help her. Mr. Kildare, you must think me a pretty terrible sort of person. Why, no. Dad. That's all right, Nancy. Well, as far as I'm concerned, there are no excuses necessary. You're very kind. Why not at all? If you don't want to do a thing, and you don't have to, why should you? Them is my sentiments, anyway. Of course. Only, sometimes it's a little hard to explain. Then why try? You know, back home, in my father's office, there's a motto hanging that says, uh, never explain. Your friends don't need it, and your enemies won't believe you anyway. Do you get away with it? Well, oh, I seem to. At least I never make a date in advance. I didn't even tell your father I was coming here this evening, simply because I might have suddenly wanted to change my mind and go out and... Uh, Come home with the milkman. <laughs> you see, Dad? I know exactly how you feel. By the way, what kind of a milkman do you have on this block? Very charming gentleman. Well, uh, 
Why can't I meet him? Wait right here. I'll slide into a dress. Remember, Dad, it was his idea and you brought him here. I see what your plan is, Doctor. But haven't you been able to arrive at any immediate conclusions? Only the obvious ones. She does love Heron. She's heartbroken at what she's doing to you, and she's doing her best to seem perfectly normal, but... Uh, Mr. Messenger, this is a very delicate point, but I must know. Did your daughter ever have any reason to hate her mother? Hate her mother? Nothing could be further from the truth. Why do you ask? Well, no reason now. Well, remember, this part is on me. Sunrise. Why did you want to bring me up here? Oh, it's just... We've had an exciting night, and I... thought perhaps you'd like to see the daylight come. Do you watch for it often? Yes. Yes. Wouldn't it be a wonderful world if it were always daylight? I've thought of that. It's funny how the night affects some people. Me, for instance. I don't like it. A grown man, afraid of the dark. Well, I'm not afraid exactly. It's just that, well, when night falls, something happens to me. Yes, yes. Look, if you're going to stay in New York, will you come to see me? If you want me to. We've been out since 9 o'clock last evening, and you've never once looked at your watch. You may not know it, but you get along with me better than anyone I know. Hmm. Anyone excepting Mr. Charles Heron. There's no one on earth like Charlie Heron. Oh, I could see you felt that way about it. When's the wedding? I'm tired. Please take me home. Of course. Uh, what did you find out about Miss Messenger? Only that she's a very complicated case. Maybe weeks before we get the answer. I, I told you that yesterday without even seeing her. Uh, I don't suppose you found time this morning to read the weather reports? No, sir. Well, that cold polar wave we've been waiting for has reached Canada. And in its wake will come pneumonia. Thousands of cases. You're going to fly north tonight to meet it. Then you'll check all the cases wherever you happen to find them. And then you'll hop in a plane and bring me back the blood cultures. While I'll be camping right here day and night doing the laboratory work. And then, Jimmy, maybe in a couple of months, we'll find out why that 7% still dies. Pardon me, sir. Don't, don't you think we ought to rest a few days before we go on? Rest? Ah, what do we want with rest? Yes! Parker, come in here. Pneumonia. It strikes so quick, and we work so slow. Why, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. This is the 20th century. We ought to be able to cure anything. And yet we let this white death, this invisible killer, run riot as though we were still living in the Dark Ages. Get me a hypo of adrenaline, quick. Mr. Gillespie, I have a bone to pick with you, and you stay. You're in this. Well, what happened? Tell me, quick. I fainted. Get outside there. Act as if nothing has happened. Give me that adrenaline. Adrenaline, yes. Oh, no, you can't burn the candle at both ends. You'll bounce back quick after this. It's just exhaustion, that's all. That's not all. And if you don't know what I mean, it's time you did. You know, too. Oh, I know everything about him. When you were running around in diapers, I was watching over him, listening to him recommend eight hours of sleep for everyone else and get along with two himself. His legs were good ones, but they wore out, trying to keep out with his willpower. He had resistance, but he loaned it to his patients and never got it back. Now his time is getting short. I didn't think he'd want anyone else to know. Well, the first day I came here, he asked me about a discoloration on his finger. Kept hounding me until I said it was a melanoma and it meant cancer. And why didn't you keep him from starting this sulfur pyridine business? Did he tell him what not to do? <laughs> What's going on here? You 
gave me a hypo, didn't you? Yes, sir. Adrenaline. Good enough. Well, what are you fussing around me for? Well, I came in here looking for trouble. <laughs> and I've only got here ahead of me. You go on back to your nurses. Not till you quit talking and go to bed. Oh, so you're a doctor now, huh? When did you start practicing? Still there. Call Dr. Carew, will you? Carew? Sure, he's the best doctor in this bowling alley. That's the reason he's head man. He'll have me skipping rope in five minutes. Dr. Carew, this is Kildare. And Dr. Gillespie has just had a slight collapse. He wants you immediately. Collapse? I didn't have any collapse. I've got the constitution of a horse. I just get tired once in a while. Well, even a horse gets tired. I'm going to send your patients home. Come back here. I'm going to send them home. When I see you skipping rope, I'm going to run around town with a basket and collect them again. Dr. Gillespie will see no one today. Everybody will be notified about new appointments. Yes, Miss Bird. Twenty-five years ago, I took you out to dinner. I might have known that sooner or later you'd take advantage of it. And you shut up, or I'll tell Dr. Kildare how you tried to put your arm around me in the lunch wagon. Leonard, I'm so sorry. Now, look, I've got a couple of mourners here already. What I need is a doctor. You listen to a doctor? You're gonna make me laugh. Well, I sent for you, didn't I? Now, listen. I passed out. Kildare injected adrenaline. I came to Pulse 78, general feeling of lassitude. I take it up from there and stick to medicine, if you still remember any. Cancel Dr. Gillespie's appointments for the rest of the day. Already cancelled. Get his bed ready and bring me three grains of sodium amytal. Yes, Doctor. I don't need any dope. I can sleep without it. But you won't. I give you my word of honor. I don't believe you. Are you doubting my word? I certainly am. Wait a minute. This is Nebutine. Do just as well. Now, uh, you take those and don't argue. Yes, Doctor. Now go to bed. You're too late, Miss Efficiency. Our corner druggist here gave me something just as good. Well, that's fine. Then off to bed you go. Take your hands off my chair. Conover! Now get out of here, you meddling female, and never dare to show your nose in my office again. You're fired. I am not. I don't work for you. I work for the hospital, thank goodness. Well, then what are you doing in my office? Go on, beat it. Get into bed, Conover. Conover, don't you pay any attention to No, me. sir, I won't. Why, you disloyal, miserable, double-crossing... Yes, sir, that's what I am, but you's going to bed. Well, I'd better get my own work cleared up, just in case. Oh, uh, by the way, Kildare, Mr. Messenger rang me up this morning. From his daughter's mood, he feels sure that, with a little time, you might gain her complete confidence. Dr. Carew, I... I understand. Naturally, you don't want to think about anything else at a moment like this. Of course, I don't have to tell you that any hospital is like a family of children, always out of the elbow, with winter coming on, no coal in the cellar. Mr. Messenger's a very rich man. Tactical. Uh, you're perfectly right. Forget about it tonight. We'll talk about it later. Kildare. The old fuss budget gone. But yes, but uh, Dr. Gillespie, you... Hey, do you know something? Patients will hold a pill in their mouth until after you've gone and then spit it out. The way I did. Promised Dr. Carew that you'd go to sleep. Oh, forget it. He broke a promise he made me back in 1921. Now, Dr. Gillespie, you and I both know that there's one particular reason, one, one inescapable reason why you must conserve your strength. You didn't tell Carew, did you? Oh, no. No, I knew you hadn't. I know you won't. Jimmy Kildare, out there, pneumonia starting on the rampage. Tonight, you're going to hop a plane. Well, Nosey, what do you want now? Dr. Gillespie, are you all right? A full report of my mental and physical condition will be made out for the files. I'll see that you get a copy. Yes, Doctor. Dr. Kildare, your mother and father are downstairs in the reception room. Oh, my mother and father here? Yes, Doctor. Well, isn't that nice? 
Give him my best regard. Uh, be back at 3 o'clock, Jimmy. We'll need a good, solid six hours together if you're going to go out tonight. Oh, Jimmy, you needn't bother telling your mother about the flying. I wrote to her all about it last week. Oh, I wrote to her, too. She says yours is a very remarkable letter. She did, eh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there's no trick to writing a good letter. <laughs> she even sent me the letter she got from you. Yeah. As a uh, enclosed fine coupon and three dollars. Please send me one pair of your loaded dice in a plain wrapper. Very truly yours, Leonard B. Gillespie. I must have put this letter in the wrong envelope. Oh! <laughs> Mother. <laughs> Hello, Dad. How are you, Jimmy? Oh, fine. Gee, this is a treat. I knew I needed something. I Now I know what it was. Let me get a good look at you. I brought your heavy overcoat, your winter underwear, and a chocolate cake. <laughs> don't let her kid you, son. The cake is for herself. Oh, don't tell me I know. I sent her a wire this morning. Happy birthday, Mother. <laughs> well, what are you two doing in New York, anyway? For this trip's to see the fair, and you, it's my birthday present from father. And we wouldn't have been able to make it if Jerry Coburn hadn't sold his farm and paid for that baby he had in 1927. Well, what about his ulcers? Did he ever pay for those? <laughs> Don't start that again, Jimmy. That's all I heard on the way down here. I made father buy a new suit, too. See, he's getting stout. <laughs> Where do we celebrate? Uh, how about Mike Sullivan's cafe? Swell food, right across the street. <laughs> Mrs. Kildare, the first time I saw your son, I knew his mother would be a fine-looking woman. Well, she's the prettiest one I could find, Mike. That's why I married her. Why not? A man goes into a store to buy a shirt. He picks the best-looking one. When he wants a wife, what should he do? Shut his eyes? You better be careful, Mike. Much more talk like that and you'll spoil it. Well, that's the way it should be. Say your prayers, pay your bills, be good to your mother, and you can walk up to anybody in the world and spit in his eye. Hey, Mike. Uh, uh, coming. I'll take this over to the bar. I need it there. Thank you. <laughs> well, I promised Jim Galt I'd buy him a sun lamp. He wants to try it for his arthritis. I'll see you back in the hotel at 3 o'clock. Goodbye, son. Goodbye, Stephen. Uh, goodbye, Mike. Goodbye, sir. Drop in tomorrow for lunch. It's Friday. We have three elegant kinds of fish. And we also have roast beef in case you bring a hazen with you. <laughs> goodbye. Goodbye. That's funny. I was just going to invent an excuse to get rid of your father. Why? So you could tell me your troubles. <laughs> uh, no use for father or me to try to keep anything from you, is it? No. I know the minute your father enters the house if he's worried. By the way he hangs up his hat. He's worried about something now, too. How can you tell? Mind reading? No. Just love and understanding. Now tell me your problem, if you want to. All right. I have to keep someone from doing something. And there just isn't any way to do it. You mean you haven't seen the way yet? Nothing's impossible, son, unless you stop trying. But this is different. Because what this person wants to do is something that should be done. It's for the good of the whole world. Oh. There's very few men left like that now. Why do you want to stop him? Because if he keeps on, it'll kill him. I'm afraid I'm not going to be much help to you. I've never had to decide big things. With you or your father, I've always been able to manage by talking a little plain, good horse sense. Except the one time I did tell him a lie. He'd been working in the garden too much. And I knew it was bad for his rheumatism, but nothing could stop him. So I hid his tools and told him a tramp stole them. <laughs> that stopped him. <laughs> well, Mother, I... Hey, wait a minute. You uh, took away his tools? Yes. Well, I think you've shown me just what to do. Oh, but right. That isn't a big problem. I've always taught you right from wrong by the power of prayer. And the back of the hairbrush. <sighs> but if I do what I think I should, I'm going to look like a snake in the grass. Jimmy, it's Dr. Gillespie you've been talking about, isn't it? Well, uh... Yes. Yes, he's in bad shape. On this particular job he's doing, I'm pretty sure he can't go ahead without me. I see. And if you quit him, he'll have to take a rest. But, son, wouldn't it almost break your heart to leave him? Well, it means...
means the finish of all I've hoped and dreamed. God bless you. Don't feel too badly, son. You may be the only one that knows you're doing the right thing. It's an awfully nice feeling. Guess it doesn't matter what the rest of the world thinks. If I were you, I wouldn't read anymore. If I were you, I'd keep my mouth shut. Leonard, please. Uh, well, maybe I don't feel so good. Your nurse will be here in a minute. Nurse? Now look here, Molly Bird. I won't have any of your frozen-faced, mealy-mouthed nurses around me. Who'd you get? Mary Lamont. And there's no use trying to soft soap her because I've told her exactly what to do. Oh, we'll see about that. Hello, honey. I had a heck of a time getting you assigned to me. Uh, Miss Bird here wanted to send in one of her favorites. But I told her, unless I had that very beautiful Mary Lamont, I, I wouldn't play. Didn't I? You did not. And don't forget Lamont. In his office, he may be a doctor, but here he's a patient. Leonard, please take care of yourself. Goodbye. I'd like a cigarette, please. Never mind that, Chad. Give me a cigarette. No cigarettes. Are you going to mind me or that fool piece of paper? No cigarettes. Now, look here, Mary. You're a very nice girl, and I like you. I'm going to give you a little advice. The great secret to being a successful nurse is to obey the rules, but at the same time, keep the patient happy. My book only says, obey the rules, period. What do you want to know about me? I'll tell you. It's time for your dinner. Let's see. Ah, now you're talking. Order me a small steak, some mashed potatoes, and a piece of apple pie, and some cheese, and a cup of coffee. Hello. I'm ordering Dr. Gillespie's dinner. Please send up a small cup of gruel, some junket, weak tea, no cream or sugar. Thank you. Oh, that's fine. And after dinner, you might order me a postage stamp. I'd like to do a little reading. What do you expect to do with that thing? I'm going to take your temperature. Any temperatures taken around here, I'll take them. What are you laughing at? Something you said last week. There's no patient in the world as ornery as a sick doctor. Yeah. And if there's going to be any talking done around here, I'll do it myself. Well, I'm not interested. What about? Jimmy Kildare. I might have expected that. 98. Write it down. Say, what are you writing there? Temperature uncertain. Patient stubborn, bad-tempered, and childish. Oh, that. What about Jimmy Kildare? Well, you should have heard him talk this morning. He was spending a multimillionaire's money last night. A steak sandwich, two bucks. And what does Jimmy think? Boom. There goes a couple of shirts. Five dollars to the waiter. Bang. A new pair of shoes. Will the orchestra leader please play boop boop a doop for Miss Nancy Messenger? Give him twenty dollars, Jimmy. Wham! Shoot a clothes. With an extra pair of pants. Throwing all that money around last night and next morning coming back to twenty dollars a month. After all, everybody's human. Mm-mm. Not everybody. You're right. You're not. The way you treat Jimmy. I mean Dr. Kildare. Taking away his evenings off and working him eighteen hours a day. Well, I work 18 hours a day. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Gillespie. I shouldn't be talking to you like this when you're not feeling very well. Hello, Mother. Hello. Did you get the sun lamp? No. They didn't have exactly what I wanted. 
Jimmy looks fine, doesn't he? Yes. I've never seen him look any better. Stephen, when you suggested coming down here, I thought there was something the matter with Jimmy, or that he was in some kind of trouble. And that you two were keeping it from me. You know, don't tell Mother. She might worry. <laughs> Nothing like that at all. I know that now. Well, do you feel better? No. Because now I know it's you. Me? You've been unhappy for days. If it isn't Jimmy, it must be you. Why don't you tell me? You're going to in the end anyway. From Dr. Jack Carboy. Just the last paragraph. The rest is all technical. I think it's coronary disease. And dear Steve, it's a very unpleasant duty to tell you but I think you may live 10 seconds. Or 10 years. Come and see me and we'll talk over the details. He says 10 seconds. Or maybe 10 years. Oh, Steve. Now, Mother, I'm going to see another doctor. That's why we came to New York. But we mustn't tell Jimmy. Martha, we've been married a long, long time. And every day has been a happy one. I had hoped that it might go on for 20 years more. You're not going to be foolish enough to tell me that you don't mind dying. So that we can think of some philosophy that will make it easier for either of us. No, dear. I just wanted to say that medicine might not do any good. But we know that tears won't. But there is one thing left. The same help and comfort we got the night that Jimmy had typhoid fever, and we waited, not knowing. You remember? I remember. He marks the sparrow's fall. Stephen, I'm going to take you to every heart specialist that's listed in the New York telephone book. I know he marks the sparrow's fall. But I remember, too, that the Lord helps those who help themselves. Yes? Dr. Kildare to see you. Send him in. Good morning, Kildare. Good morning, sir. Dr. Carew, what have you done about the messenger case? Nothing. Nothing at all. I'd like to take it. You would? Yes, sir. I think it's too big an opportunity to miss. Oh, but uh, does Dr. Gillespie know? No. No, not yet. I hesitate to take you away from him without his knowledge and permission. Well, Dr. Carew, I've made up my mind. If necessary, I'll hand in my resignation. Oh, no, no, no. Yes, Dr. Carew. I'm assigning Dr. Kildare to bring the messenger case. Make out an order and I'll sign it. Oh, Dr. Carew, please, I, I'd rather tell Dr. Gillespie myself than have him learn it through an official order. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Yes, sir? Don't put through that order about Dr. Kildare until I let you know. Well, this is all very fortuitous. Solving the messenger case will be a priceless asset to you when you're ready to go out into private practice, and, uh, of course, it won't do the hospital any harm. I've taken that all into consideration. Mm. Uh, what's the latest report on Dr. Gillespie? Uh, there it is. Haven't you seen him? No, Nurse Molly Bird asked me not to go in. We're not very happy about his condition. I can see that. Wait outside, Mary. I don't want you to hear what I got to say to the head of your hospital. What's this I hear about you taking Kildare away from me and putting him on the messenger case? Why, who told you? Oh, I knew about it before the echo of your voice giving the order died away. What have you been saying to my boy? I've told you 10,000 times to run your hospital and let my office alone. There wasn't anything he said, sir. I made up my own mind. Yeah, that's absolutely true, Leonard. Get out of here. Are you crazy? You know I can't go along with our work alone. I'm sorry, sir. But Jimmy, you're tired. Take the day off. Go out and get some relaxation. 
You will feel differently about it tomorrow. No. Messenger's too big a chance to give up. Oh, I don't see any reason why I should go on working 24 hours a day on, on something that won't pay me a cent when, when I can get in with one of the richest men in New York. So, Dr. Kildare, Mr. Messenger waves a checkbook in your face and you drop me like a hot potato. I've waited 20 years for an assistant and I find I've picked a common little money grubber. What did you want to study medicine for? You'd have made a swell pawnbroker. Mary. Take me back, will you? I'm tired. Here's your fishing rod, Doctor. Fishing rod? Where'd I get a fishing rod? Remember that fellow that we killed? The one that had the misery in his back? He gave us this. What are you grinning about? Well, I'm glad you have to go away. I mean, I'm glad you're sick enough to be well enough to go... I mean, if you're getting some sleep, it'll give you some... Well, this is a fish basket. Take it with you. That isn't mine. Oh, yes, it is. I meant to give it to you for a Christmas present last year, but I forgot all about it. Molly, you're lying. You can't prove it. This is nice to keep hot coffee in. Where did that come from? It had the hospital's name on it, but I scratched it off. <laughs> well, under those circumstances, I'll take it. Well, for years I've known you've had stooges reporting to you. But this is the first I've heard you have them stealing for you. Miss Lamont, write this into your report. My patient was feeling fine until 15 or 20 chattering females descended on him. Now, goodbye, quick. I guess I can take a hint. I'll see you before you leave tonight, Leonard. I'll be at the train, Doctor. Should I go help Dr. Kildare pack his things, sir? Come over. No. The idea. After all you've done for him. Leaving you for a hypochondriac debutante with blonde hair and lots of money. Uh-uh. Another count he heard from. What do you mean? I forgot about the time we were worried about Jimmy and the redhead. You've been in love with him ever since. That's not true. Oh, let's stop kidding ourselves. We're both sunk. <laughs> so that's the reason as soon as I got to New York, I telephoned your father. You're lunching with him, aren't you? Yeah. I'll see you later. Of course, we have a date for a walk, haven't we? Right. Dad, if Jimmy's late, you charge it to my account. I will not. I'll take it out of your allowance. Come in, Jimmy. Sit down. I know nothing definite yet. Human behavior, especially unexpected behavior, is very often the outcome of some fixation in childhood. What are you driving at? Well, some instinct, and I can't rationalize it, keeps bringing me back to Nancy's mother. Don't you know anything... That was over 12 years ago. There was never any divorce. Uh, Mrs. Messenger and I had separated for several years. And you have no direct information of your wife and daughter during those years? No, I was in Europe. Mrs. Messenger died of pneumonia, hmm? Yes, she'd been ill for some time with a complication of ailments. But the end came through pneumonia. Where? At that Long Island place out near Eastbury. You understand that at the time I got back to this country, it was all over. The funeral, everything. I haven't been to Eastbury since. Does Nancy ever visit the Long Island home? I imagine so. You see, Mrs. Messenger requested that Nancy's nurse should occupy it as long as she lived. Nancy's nurse? There's a woman named Nora. I'd like to talk to this, Nora. That can be easily managed. I'll telephone. No. No, let me see if I can't arrange to meet Nora without anyone, even Nancy, suspecting anything. Isn't this much nicer than a walk in the park? Oh, of course. But you certainly changed your mind fast. Oh, it wasn't really a whim. When I got out of my shower, there was a phone message calling me to Long Island. So here we are. No, 
Nora. My little lamb. <laughs> Nora, this is Mr. Kildare. Pleased to meet you, sir. How do you do? Well, come in, come in. Well, now, let me take your things. Oh, my. This is the nicest surprise I've had since the last time you came. Surprise, Nora? Why, it was your message that brought me. What message? I didn't send you any message. Well, that's funny. Well, what did the message say? It said to come to Long Island immediately. But maybe they took the message wrong. I'll ask the servants when I get home. Well, old fella. Well, what's wrong with you? Poor thing's been limping around oh. here for a week. Oh. Oh, well, Pete, you have a bad shoulder there. You found out quick enough. Oh, I just happened to hit the sore spot. Looks to me like you were asking questions with your fingers, the way doctors do. Well, what's wrong with doctors, Nora? What's right with them? Nora. They stood by and let your mother die right before your eyes, didn't they? Nora, please. I'm sorry, darling. What's the matter, Nancy? It's one of those headaches again. Headaches? Well, how long have you been having headaches? I don't know. For months. Nancy, are you going to keep on tearing yourself apart with these headaches? Or once and for all, are you going to see him? I don't know. Him? Who's him, Nora? A doctor? <laughs> no, he's too good to be a doctor. He cures people instead of letting them die. Friend of yours, Nora? Mr. Archley's a friend of everybody who believes in him. Nancy, you must see him now, today. When the blindness comes, even he can't help you. Nora, don't, don't. Nancy. Nancy, why not do as Nora says? Oh, what's the use? Nobody can help me. Oh, please, Nancy, I'll go with you. Just come and talk to him. Oh, I don't know who the man is or what he can do, but every day miracles happen that no one can explain. Anyone as young as you, Miss Messenger, is not meant to suffer pain. But you do, don't you? Violent headaches. I can see that. Mr. Archley, Miss Messenger has just had a very severe attack. Don't you think she should uh, lie down and rest a while before you proceed? Uh, yes, uh, yes. An excellent idea. Nora, will you take her, please? In here, my dear. your idea in doing that. You see, I know that Nora's told you all about Miss Messenger. Which is, of course, what she should have done. We're all only concerned with making Nancy well again. Of course, of course. Just what is your connection with the case, Mr. Kildare? Now, isn't it enough that I induced her to come and see you? After all, Nora wasn't able to, was she? Obviously, I'm in your debt. What's worrying you? As an old friend of the family, I know more about Miss Messenger's case than Nora does. Is that so? Of what, for instance? Well, six months ago, Nora revealed to Nancy the true cause of her mother's death, right? Suppose I tell you Nora was wrong. Wrong? But, uh, the mother's symptoms, as Nora describes them to me, sound very conclusive. Symptoms? Oh, well, headaches, blindness. Why couldn't they indicate a dozen different things? Meningitis, for instance. Meningitis? Ah, doctor, you must understand I'm only trying to help you and help Nancy. Uh, if, as we all believe, Nancy has inherited her mother's trouble, we must be sure we're on the right track. Mr. Kildare, unless you have some specific information, I must believe that periodic headaches plus muscular imbalance plus blindness can mean only one thing. Muscular imbalance? Well, uh, suppose I'm wrong. Just how do you propose to treat Miss Messenger for this uh, brain tumor? The first principle of my treatment is to cleanse the mind with truth. I then cure the body with natural methods and electro-vibrations. Oh, you're not going to tell that girl she has a brain tumor. Of course, it's essential to my course of treatment. But you mustn't tell her. You'll excuse me now, Mr. Kildare. I must attend my patient. Look here, Archley. That girl's half out of her mind with fear already. Nothing more than her own suspicions to frighten her. Oh, she doesn't know that Nora's told you the whole story. So if you diagnose her trouble as brain tumor, she's... She's liable to lose her mind entirely. I don't agree, Dr. Kildare. Oh, yes, you're a doctor. Well, I don't have to be a doctor to see what your game is. You're going to tell her she has a tumor, knowing full well that she hasn't, 
so that you can pretend to cure something that doesn't exist. Well, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to let you tell her anything like that. Nora, Miss Messenger, I'm convinced I can bring you back to perfect health. But Dr. Kildare here seems to think differently. Doctor. It's true, Nancy. Sorry I had to learn it this way. There's no use keeping it a secret any longer. I'm a doctor. You, Jimmy. You a doctor. Enough of a doctor to know that you're not going blind and you're not going to die. Because you don't have a brain tube. Don't. Nancy, I'm a pretty good doctor. And every instinct I have tells me there's nothing wrong with you. Nothing but grief and fear and brooding imagination. <laughs> Since you're a doctor, you ought to be the one to drive this poor child's talk raving crazy. Did you mean that? Hasn't she got any tumor? Now you need a little rest, dear. Hello, Nancy. Will you leave us alone, please? But you can't, Nora, please. Sorry to follow you here, Nancy, but I had to get things settled. Settled? You realize, of course, that you haven't let me see you for a week, although I've called at the house at least every day. The situation is very obvious, Nancy. You just don't love me anymore. But you're too nice to tell me so. I realize now that it's up to me to make it easier for you. Goodbye, Nancy. You'll never see me again. I'll never see him again. Nora! Nora! Emergency call, Blair General Hospital, New York City. Oh, hello, Dr. Kildare. No, Joe Wayman's not on duty tonight. He finally promised to buy me a dinner, and he didn't seem feverish when he said it either. Hey, did you say Dr. Kildare? Oh, excuse Kildare? me, Doctor. Here he is. Hello, Doc. This is Joe. Oh, Joe. Joe, I'm in a spot, and I need action. I want you to bring me an ophthalmoscope and a perimeter out to Long Island right away. Yeah, grab the first bus. I'm on my way. I didn't have anything important to do tonight anyway. Where are you? Okay, Doc. I'm sorry about that dinner tonight, Sally. My system must be wrong. Other girls get diamond bracelets and I can't even promote a cheese sandwich. That bus is usually right on time here. On the dot. Take it easy, brother. You've got 25 minutes yet. There's the bus schedule. Fire. Oh, it's my house. Just paid the insurance yesterday. Oh. Uh -huh. Twenty-one miles in nineteen and a half minutes. I'd have made it sooner, only it makes me nervous to go fast. How'd you get the ambulance? <laughs> You're my pal and you said you are in a hurry. I am. The gadgets are in the back. Let's get going. Hey, doctor. I have to see her. You're not going to. But she hasn't a brain tumor. I'm positive she hasn't. If I can only see her and examine her eyes, I know I can convince her. You've done enough harm already. Nora, you must let me see her. Adam! Well, baby, the moment we got that phone call, I knew I'd be needing you. Oh, excuse me a minute, Doc. I want to take a look at that back tire. Hey, Doc! How do you like that? These yokels don't fight fair. This guy tried to pull a hammer on me.
Nancy. Nancy. Look, I know how you feel about me, but I want to help you. I'm sure you don't have brain tumor. I'm positive we can straighten everything all out. Oh, please, Nancy, please look at me. Jimmy, I can't see you. I can't see anything, Jimmy. I'm blind. Honor, do you realize that every year millions of men abandon their sweethearts and wives and families just to go fishing? Any excuse is better than none. And what have they got to show for? This. Throw them back in. Do unto others, you'd have them do unto you. Amen. Fish don't agree with me anyway. You call this a vacation, Connor. I wish you wouldn't move that umbrella so the sun hits my neck through that hole. Sun do you good. Violet rain. Oh, violet applesauce. Too doggone healthy now. If you hadn't come on this year vacation, it's two to one right now. I'd be walking slow behind you. Why, I'll bet you. Conover, betting is gambling. And gambling is illegal. Furthermore, it's foolish because you can't win. I've had it in my mind to teach you something about gambling for some time now. Out of the dim past, I seem to remember that if you get a seven or an eleven, you win. Yes, Doctor. And if you get a two, three, or twelve, you lose. I'll roll you for a dollar. Ain't it? Lucky seven, you win. Uh, let me breathe on them once for luck. Go on, breathe away. Conover, <sighs> how much money you got on you? I was carrying four dollars. Four dollars, huh? <laughs> Snake eye, I win. <laughs> Double sixes. I win. How much money do you owe me now, Doctor? Twenty-two dollars. Now that shows you what a fool a man is to gamble. Those dice I brought with me are crooked. Still, I couldn't win. No, Doctor. Here's your dice. I switched on you when I breathed on them. There's a man walking towards us. Probably somebody from the hospital. Tell him I'm asleep. Howdy, Dr. Kildare. Hello, Conover. Uh, may I speak to you for a moment, Dr. Gillespie? Can't you see I'm asleep? I, uh, I hate to be a nuisance, sir, but while I'm at the end of my rope. So you hung yourself, huh? Well, it's about the messenger girl. She's in the hospital. She's totally blind. Blind? Dr. Gillespie, Miss Messenger's optic nerve seems entirely normal. There's no sign of deterioration. By every test, she should be able to see. But she's blind. Please, Dr. Gillespie, if you can't come back to the hospital, I'd like to bring her here to see you. No, young Dr. Kildare. You dug this pit for yourself. Get yourself out of it. Goodbye. When's the next train leave for New York? About a half an hour. Well, what are we waiting for? My lecture today deals with the type of human suffering that invariably baffles the young doctor. And a great many old doctors as well. 
This is difficult to diagnose because it conceals itself under the symptoms of every known disease. There was, for instance, a woman totally bereft of speech. Shrewd investigation finally revealed that she'd called out to her little daughter who, running across the street in answer, had been struck down by a car and killed. The subconscious realization that her own voice had called the child to its death paralyzed the mother's vocal cords. Even psychoanalysis failed to affect the cure. We were forced to pretend to operate on her throat. And by this means, convince her that we'd restored her speech surgically. Evidently, Dr. Kildare regards our kindergarten as beneath his notice. <laughs> Who is it? Dr. Kildare. Nancy, I've found out what's wrong with your eyes, and I can cure you. It's been nothing but a simple little myopic strain that always responds to a minor operation. Always? Always. Next patient! I'm pretty sure I know what the trouble is. Don't you tell me what the trouble is. I'll tell you what the trouble is. But, Doctor... Go on, get in there in the next room and take off your clothes. Huh? Go on, don't argue with me. Get in there. Go on, on. get in. Next patient. Oh, ho, ho. well, good morning. Good morning. Sit down. Thank you. <laughs> well, I know you. Of course you do. I'm Jimmy Kildare's mother. Yeah, a very bull-headed young man. Well, how are you? I suppose you've come to ask me to take him back. Nothing of the sort. Why, don't you want him to be my assistant? I want him to be what he wants to be. And when he makes a mistake, I want him to find out why he made it, so he won't do it again. Uh, suppose he failed. I'm his mother. I can't even imagine it. <laughs> Dr. Gillespie, would you examine my husband? Well, what's the matter with him? I'll never be satisfied till you tell me what you think. I... Oh, I'll wait till you finish reading. Oh, go on talking. I can't stand people who can't do more than one thing at a time. I don't want Jimmy to know anything about this. Why, you don't suppose I'd tell him, do you? Ah, I see. Well, bring him in Monday morning at 11 o'clock. Oh, thank you very much. You're very kind. No, no, this way, Mrs. Kildare. I'm very sorry about you and Jimmy. Your son is a natural-born objector, madam. He doesn't care which side of an argument he takes as long as everybody else is on the other side. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye, Mrs. Kildare. Hey, you! Come on out! Now I'll listen to you. What's the matter with you? Nothing at all. I never was sick a day in my life. I just come here to repair your telephone. I've already explained my belief that one Miss Messenger experienced several commonplace headaches. Nora, ridden by fanatic fears, convinced the girl that she had a brain tumor, inherited from her mother. But now my conclusion is that the factor which directly induced Nancy's mysterious blindness was Mr. Heron's words, you will never see me again. Will you come in now, please? Has Dr. Kildare made it clear that Miss Messenger has been led to believe that an operation has been performed on her for a trivial eye ailment? Yes, oh yes. Nancy? Nancy, I'm going to take the bandage off, and you're going to be able to see. And you'll know, as I know, that there isn't a single thing wrong with you now. I'll be there. I'll believe everything. If only I can see. Well, I'm so sure of it that I've arranged a little surprise for you. Surprise? Mm-hmm. The first thing you'll see will be, uh... Nancy. Charlie. Charlie. Now the room is full of sunlight.
Nancy, darling. Oh, dear. Thank God. Fine work, Doctor. We'll talk about gratitude some other time. Uh, do you think I might go in to see her, Doctor? Oh, yes. A good idea to knock first. Oh. Dr. Kildare, Dr. Gillespie would like to see you at once. You sent for me, sir? I sent for a lot of unimportant people. You just happened to get here first. <laughs> well, uh, Dr. Gillespie, without knowing it, you've done me a very great service. You'll be happy to hear that Miss Messenger... I not... don't want to hear anything about your diamond-studded millionaire patients. I got a couple of pretty good patients myself. Parker! Send in those patients! You know, the funny thing is, ever since you left here, everything's been running like clockwork. What patients? Those two people, the man and the woman, you nitwit. Oh, why didn't you say so? Isn't her fault. I don't talk loud enough. Mother. Dad, what are you two doing? Now, what's the matter? Is something wrong? Dad, are you ill? No, Jimmy. Mm. Oh, Mother, I have a right to know. We were worried about your father's heart, Jimmy. Oh, why didn't you tell me? But we know it's all right now. Dr. Gillespie, they're trying to make me think there's nothing serious. Uh, my diploma's over there. Have a look at it. Well, are you sure, Dr. Gillespie? Did you look for any signs of thrombosis? You little whippet! Are you questioning my diagnosis? I beg your pardon, sir. I didn't mean that. Oh, yes, you did, too. Ever since you started your Park Avenue practice, you don't trust any doctor unless he wears a high hat and spats. I'm sorry, sir. Yeah. Well, you should have told me. Well, it was our worry until we had to tell you, Jimmy. Then stop fretting about it. It's all over now, isn't it? Yes, but the past two minutes I've been doing some fast thinking. About what? My week off next month. I was going to spend it in the research clinic, but now I'm coming home and stay with you. Oh, oh we like that, son. <laughs> I want to tell you how happy you've made us, sir, but I don't know what to say. Well, why don't you say something stupid? You usually do. Well, Stephen, are you going to stand around there gossiping with Dr. Gillespie all day? Huh? This is a place for sick people, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, doctor, I said everything I could think of in there, but I I'd like to say it again. I'll write me a letter about it. <laughs> See you later, son. Well, we're going to have dinner together, aren't we? Uh-huh. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye, son. Now, let's see. Who are you? Oh, yes, I remember. A Irish pawnbroker named Kildare. I'm still grateful for what you've done for my father. Are you still here? Well, I just want a minute more, sir. Uh, the messenger girl is cured, thanks indirectly to you. To me? Yes, and to the happy coincidence that your lecture gave me the clue. Happy coincidence. <laughs> Isn't that splendid? The first happy coincidence was that I happened to come back from my vacation on that particular day. The second happy coincidence was that I happened to lecture for the first time in a year. And the third happy coincidence was that I picked that particular subject. <laughs> happy coincidence. Why, you stupid little tadpole, I've been leading you around like a pug dog on a string. Well, uh, I don't know. I don't know what to say. Well, you've said that before. As regards the messenger case, even good doctors often forget that fear is a tyrant over the body as well as the mind. People can acquire the evil results of every disease just through fear alone. I had an instinctive feeling about that case from the beginning. From you the be should have been positive, young Dr. Kildare. There's nothing new about it. Why, way back in the Middle Ages, when the Black Plague killed half the people in Europe, there were thousands of folks that died of the disease and didn't have it at all. I thought I was so smart. Nah, there's only one really smart guy around here, and that's me. I know everything. 
I'm convinced of that. Yeah. I know even more than you think I do. For instance, I know that you didn't quit your job with me on account of Paul Messenger's money. What, Wyla? Easy now, Jimmy, easy. You knew I'd have to stop and take a rest if you walked out on me. So, you walk out on me. <laughs> I'll never forget that, Jimmy. Oh, how did you find out? Who could have told you? Oh, nobody told me. I figured it out for myself. That is to say, I figured it out after I'd wangled around with your mother for a while. <laughs> Mary Lamont, come here. How did you know I was here? I've got an extra eye in the back of my head. I heard everything. <laughs> Mary, that's one of the things you'll have to learn if you're going to be in love with the doctor. Uh, I've got to do something. <laughs> None so blind as those who won't see. But, uh, excuse me, I have something to do, too. No, you haven't. Tonight, you've got a date with an airplane and a bottle of sulfur pyridine. Well. <laughs> oh, don't let the local doctors give you any gawk. I'll try not to do anything wrong. Suppose we do everything wrong. Someday, some fella smarter than we are will look it all over and say, well, thank heaven I don't have to waste my time finding that out. He'll find the real answer to pneumonia. He'll get the real answer to pneumonia that much sooner. Yes, sir. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, son. Hey, you Lincoln poop! Look out what you're doing with that umbrella! find a cue for pneumonia real quick. All right, what's it to you? Because I was getting it right now. <laughs> 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 